okay uh, so today is my last lecture so what i want to uh, talk about is the inner product and orthogonality so so what we're going to is define an inner product on the polynomial representation cx and um, so to define this so what i'll need is something called the sheridnik kernel so this is sometimes called so this is delta sub qt uh, defined as follows so it's a product over all positive roots r plus of the affine uh, lie algebra here so I'll, i'll just explain this in a moment so you you take the product of 1 minus x to the alpha over 1 minus t x to the alpha okay and so what is this uh, positive affine root a uh, set of positive affine roots mean here so we are talking about gln or sln so recall that the the root system so this is now just the finite root system if you wish so what are the positive roots of the finite root system here they are all the epsilon i minus epsilon j s 1 less than or equal to i less than j less than or equal to n so these are the gln positive roots if you wish and the corresponding affine algebra the affinization let's say of sln has uh, the following positive roots so i should call this f so you take the positive roots alpha of the finite guy and to those you add various multiples of this so called null root delta so this is overall p integers greater than or equal to 0 and you take all the negative roots so i should have said and alpha ranging over the finite positive guys union minus alpha plus p plus 1 delta okay, so I, i want to make alpha range again over the positive roots of the finite guy and p greater than or equal to 0 so uh, these are just the roots of the corresponding affine algebra if you wish and uh, of course you may be wondering where the q went um, so uh, well so here's the here's really what we mean by this so if you observe this product involves terms of the form x to the alpha where alpha is is ranges over uh, the positive affine guys so a typical positive affine root so what is alpha a, a positive find root look like it looks like some beta plus some p delta right so where beta is either a positive or a negative root of the finite guy so i mean here when i say minus alpha that's basically just a negative root and so uh, when you see a term which looks like x to the alpha in this product what we mean by that is it's x to the beta times uh, well x to the p delta but then we make the following so wherever you see an e to the delta that's you replace that with a q okay so think of this as notation if you wish that this product really is uh, you know the the various x to the alphas that you see here are really the the monomials they they look like this there are some monomials x to the betas where beta is from x in some sense so this is in cx if you wish multiplied by a suitable power of q but this is sort of very compact uh, um, way of expressing the same thing okay and uh, also something which will come up later observe that each of these factors here each of these terms in the product is something that we have seen before this is almost well it's a reciprocal of what we would have written as c alpha xt so recall this came up in various places including in the intertwiner and so on so this is there was a t to the minus half outside and then there is a 1 minus p I mean there it involved y's instead of x's but this is just the corresponding version with x here so sorry should have put 
alpha then. dx to the alpha over 1 minus x to the alpha. So okay. it's an infinite product, right? Uh, it's an infinite product, yes. This is an infinite product. Uh, so the, the way to think about it is that if you expand this out into a power series, so I mean, uh, at the moment, if you just pretend that Q and T, for example, are just some indeterminates, then this expands out into a power series. Okay? So I just use one over one minus Tx to the alpha equals one plus that plus that squared and so on. Now that expansion will look like the following. So what sorts of terms are you going to get? You're only going to get, uh, you know, sums of various alphas, where alpha ranges over a positive affine roots, right? So this will only have things which look like x to the gamma, where gamma belongs to what you call the uh, positive half of the affine root lattice. So Q plus affine, Q plus. sorry, I keep putting my plus and app in various places. So, uh, so this is this is just the Z span, if you wish, Z plus span of the positive affine roots. Okay, so those are the only sorts of monomials you'll get. And well, uh, what are the coefficients? They are all going to just be polynomials in T because a given uh, monomial x to the gamma can only get contributions from finitely many of these terms. Okay, and so you can you can view this as a power series in the in these monomials in the x to the gammas, uh, or maybe in x one, x two, x n, if you wish. Um, so so okay. So there there is also q there, if you wish. But uh, so this is one way of thinking about it. Okay, but I'm I'm very soon going to sort of make this somewhat simpler to to deal with so let me just go ahead and say that so recall that uh, for us of course q and t are not indeterminates we're thinking of them as complex numbers so let me do the following let me fix q to be a well uh, it's a complex number which is transcendental over q so let me recall this was and just so that we can sort of think of these as rational functions and so on so I'm just going to say some element which is transcendental over Q, rational numbers. And I'm also going to take T to be uh, a positive integral power of, of Q. Okay, so K here is now strictly positive integer. Okay, so this is going to be my, my assumption for the rest of rest of today. Okay, so now with under these assumptions, the Sheridnik kernel delta Q T, which I will now so delta q, q power k, which I will abbreviate to delta sub k, has a much simpler form. So notice now that there will actually be lots of cancellations. So if you look at what the product looked like, uh, you know, so I'm just going to take t to be some power of q. So, you know, the, the very same term will, will sort of appear. It's like a telescoping product okay? because alpha plus k delta on top will be canceled off by the term which corresponds to, you know, Q power K times X power alpha. So that, that's like a telescoping cancellation here. And your final uh, thing is just a finite product. Okay, so what you're going to get at the end is just the following. It's alpha ranging over all the epsilon I minus epsilon Js. So the finite uh, roots, finite positive roots, each of which will have sort of there are only these many uncancelled terms after the telescoping. So I equals zero to k minus one, one minus x to the alpha q to the i, and then corresponding terms for the negatives as well. So x to the minus alpha q to the i plus one. Okay, so now it's actually just a just a polynomial really equation. It's just a finite product now. Okay, so you can think of this uh, as belonging to C x. Um, I didn't get the telescoping. So it's still x to the alpha in the denominator also, right? So, so there is a x to the alpha in the denominator. But then recall each alpha is of the form beta plus something delta, right? Uh, so alphas look like beta. So, so you fix a beta. So let's say alpha looks like this beta plus p delta, where p ranges over all uh, positive integers. Suppose beta is positive. Right? So the x to the alpha itself has a q in it. It's actually x to the beta times q to the p, if you wish. And one minus t was again, 
chosen to be so it's x to the beta q to the p plus k now because of this choice that p is q power k right is that all right and now the product is over all affine positive roots which in particular means i must uh, take the product over all p p greater than or equal to 0 so, so either this for, uh, yeah. this for a single beta so now now the cancellation is here so there are so, so many uncancelled terms in the numerator That's all right. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, and the same thing for the negative roots. I mean, you also also should do this for the. I mean, there's also a product of the betas, and if beta is negative, this product will run from one to infinity rather than from zero. Oh, so that's the uh, that's the cancellation here. So what is the 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 Schrodinger kernel now? Just becomes this finite uh, product. You can think of it as an element of k x, but in fact, I mean, really, it has coefficients which are you know powers of q. So uh, to define an involution very soon so i'm just going to define a certain subfield of the complex number so let's just take q q take the subfield generated by q or over q think of that and so in fact this uh, we can say something more that this is actually in kx okay so this this kx is sub, sub of cx okay so that's uh, that's where my Uh, delta sub k lives. Okay, so that's the Schrodinger kernel. Now, uh, what's my inner product? So let's define the inner product. So to define this, I need an involution. So okay, let's let's just go ahead and define this. So if I have f one, f two, two elements in k x now. Okay, so k remember is just I mean think of k as c if you wish. I just need this to define the involution properly. So I take two elements of of k x. Uh, I want to define the inner product. I do it as follows: f1, f2. Uh, sorry, Vishnu, could you yes. just track back and the sure. uh, and then uh, uh, yeah. So I lost where. What was k now? Uh, k, the field you mean? Yeah. Uh, so I've taken it to be q, q, q. Remember, it's a transcendental element over q. So I'm taking the subfield of C generated by q. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, you'll see in just a second why I need this. So, uh, so I'm going to define an involution uh, on K. So, okay, so here's my here's my definition. So, this and is, what does the bracket X mean now? Uh, which bracket X? K bracket X. So this is this is the same. Uh, see, C of X was just the 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 group algebra of the, uh, the X plus lattice. minus X plus minus X. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah. All that. Yeah. All all that. Yes. All that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is just yeah. the group algebra of the root lattice over the field K instead of over C. Okay. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Yes. So uh, F one F two. This is now the inner product is defined as follows. It is F one. F two bar bar is an involution which I will define in a moment times the Schrödinger kernel delta k. Okay, so this is my definition. The C T is the constant term, is it? Constant term. Yes. yes. So I I will define all the terms now. So this is going to be minor term. Okay. So what is this? Uh, what are the terms involved here? So first, uh, what's what's the bar? Okay. So that's where I need this. So uh, firstly, on this field k, I have the following involution. Okay. So which is I just send q to q inverse. And I send the rational numbers to themselves, of course. So the rationals will just map to as identity. So I I have this this involution, and on the group algebra itself on K X, the bar denotes the following involution, which takes uh, you know which does this, and in addition which also maps. So this is just going to the scalars Q map under this involution, the X to the mu's. Basis elements map to x to the minus one. Okay, so this is called the bar. So now this this is the map which is sending each f to f bar. So a typical f is going to be a linear combination of uh, the x mu's with coefficients coming from k. So uh, I map it to f bar as follows. I I map the coefficients to you know the their bars, which is just replacing q by q inverse, and I I map the x mu's to x to the minus one. Yeah, so this is the definition of, of the involution bar on KX. This is an algebra involution, and uh, so I take f1 into f2 bar, multiply it by this delta sub k, and a constant term is the following. Uh, observe that if I so if I have an element of KX, 
uh, so if I have an element f in k of x, a constant term is, is just a constant term in the usual sense of the word. It's a Laurent polynomial in x. The constant term of f is simply the coefficient of x power 0. Okay, so this is an element of k now. Okay, so that's uh, so that defines all the terms that I need. So the constant term. So so observe f1 and f2 are both in kx. So is f1 f2 bar delta sub k was already in kx. So this this product of these three fellows is an element of kx, and I take its constant term. Okay, so that's the the definition. So what have I defined? We have defined a map. It's it's an inner product. It's a map now. It's a form from kx cross kx to kx. Okay, so that's what this. I don't uh, want k. I'm sorry, what? I don't want k on the right side. Uh, k on the right side, yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So um, le let's look at the properties of this map. So uh, it's obviously Q bilinear. Okay. So if I put, if I multiply uh, either of the two things by a Q, that just comes out because the bar, the involution doesn't do anything. Here. But it's K sesquilinear, the sense that if I multiply uh, this guy by a constant coming from k. If I multiply it on the left, the constant just comes out as it is. So uh, okay, so there is a sub k everywhere, which I am going to sort of suppress soon. F1, F2. Whereas if I multiply the same thing on the right, it will come out as a bar. Okay, and this is now for k coming from this field k for all c in k. Okay, again, very easy to see because uh, if you sort of see the definition, it was constant term. So let's just do the second one f1 c f2 bar times the delta. Right? This is this is the definition of this side. And uh, c times f2 bar by definition, the coefficients all have to become bars as well. Right? You take bars on the monomials x mu, but also on the coefficients. So this, this C will just come out as its bar, which is C bar. And uh, the, the other things remain the same. And observe the constant term, uh, delta k, sorry. the constant term map. See, what was the constant term? It was just, you had to take this thing and find its coefficient of x power 0. So if you multiply the, the whole thing by some element of k, that element of k just comes out. So it's k times the constant term of f1, f2 bar. Okay, so that's that's the proof that um, when you pull out on the second common, it'll come out as a bar. Uh, so it's sesquilinear in that sense. And the third property, which is that if you interchange the two, f2, f1. So okay, so now I, uh, there's again a k there. So what do you get? Well, you don't quite get just the bar of f1, f2, but uh, there's a certain power of two, which comes out, power of q, so, okay. Uh, let's just quickly see why this is the case. So again, observe, if I had to find the constant term of any element f, again, it's just the coefficient of x power zero. So I can just take bar of the whole thing so bars will change all x mu's to x minus mu's, but x to the zero still goes to x to the zero, right? So uh, the monomial goes to itself, and then the coefficient will become a bar. So if I if I take constant term of f bar, that's just constant term of f the the whole bar, if you wish. So uh, that's more or less what's what's involved in this in this proof. If I take the constant term of f two f one bar delta k. then uh, I can just take bar on the whole thing. 
Okay, so the bar of this is just the thing in the opposite order. I mean, with bars everywhere. So I, I can make this F1. I can put a bar on the F2, but I should also put a bar on the delta k. Okay, so, so this is just a simple property of the constant term map. And now it really comes down to understanding what putting bar on delta k means. Okay, so if you see what the, the bar operation does to delta k, uh, so let me just quickly, quickly point out. So, so it's just a simple calculation. So this was one minus q power i x power alpha. Let me write delta k first. One minus q power i plus one x to the minus alpha. Okay. So this was i going from zero to k minus one, alpha ranging over the finite positive roots. So this was delta k itself. Now when you put bars, so what do you have to do? You must make this a minus this a minus, uh, put minus on the whole thing. Okay, so this is what happens. So in some sense, when you think in terms of the affine roots, what's happening is each affine root, um, you know, beta maybe is going to minus beta. Okay, but now you all you have to do is sort of just uh, rearrange these terms. So now it's just a simple manipulation. You you just pull out this, you know, you, you, you sort of clear the denominator if you wish. To rewrite this as q power minus i x power minus alpha, pull that out and then rewrite it as so maybe the minus sign, it has this minus sort of the usual sort of algebraic manipulation. Now do the same thing here, pull this guy out and rewrite it. And then uh, if you see the, the only remaining, so it becomes almost the same as delta k, except that there are some powers of q in front. Okay, so the, the x's will cancel because there's a plus and a minus. So there's some, some net power of q that you incur after you do this, this manipulation. So, so this, this guy here uh, stems purely from what happens when you change delta k to delta k bar. So when you try to compute this, this is exactly the power of q that you get. Okay, so this is a sketch of the proof as to why uh, f1, f2 bar is this power of q times the, the thing in the other order. Okay, so now the, the key thing that we are interested in, are well, there are other uh, important transformation properties, if you wish, for the delta k. Okay, so we just looked at one of them. If you apply bar to delta k, it's some power of q times delta k again. But uh, there are other transformation properties and they are sort of uh, nicely encapsulated as uh, certain adjoints so, so what do I mean by an adjoint? So recall, uh, if I have an operator T on Kx, for example, then the adjoint of T, by that I'll just mean an operator which has the, the usual property. Okay, this, this is what you would call an adjoint, T star of T. Uh, of course, it's not clear that a given operator has an adjoint necessarily. So firstly, we're talking about an infinite dimensional space here, Kx. So recall all these operators I'm talking about are maps from kx to kx. Okay, so it may not happen that something has an adjoint, etc. But uh, the, the key point for us is the following, that the operators that we care about all have adjoints. Okay, so what are the operators we care about? Well, there's one obvious operator here which has an adjoint. Let's look at the first one. Look, look at the multiplication operator by x to the mu. Okay, so let's take the operator which takes each x to the gamma and maps it to x to the mu plus gamma. Okay, this is a multiplication operator, x to the mu. Now, uh, this operator has an adjoint. Okay, why? Because, and well, what is the adjoint? So if I multiply a given f1 by x to the mu and compute this, this is just constant term x to the mu f1 f2 bar delta. But to compute the adjoint, I should somehow push this x to the mu into the second component, right? So I can think of the same thing as the constant term of f1, x to the minus mu f2 bar times delta k. Okay, in other words, the, the multiplication by x to the mu has a joint, which is multiplication by x to the minus mu. Okay, so this is just a straightforward property of the constant term map itself. Now, 
so of course that's sort of the first of the operators that come from the double affine Hecke algebra. So recall, finally, our our interest is going to be on the various operators coming from the double affine Hecke algebra, which act on the polynomial representation. So what's the second guy? So recall what are well what are the other fellows? So we have we have talked about the x to the mu. Uh, then recall the double affine Hecke algebra has p1, t2, tn minus one. Then there are the y to the lambda checks. Right. So we have, we've sort of figured out that this guy has an adjoint. Now, so do all the others. So let's let me just state this proposition. And again, quickly sketch what's involved in the proof. So the the TIs all have adjoints. They turn out to be the inverses. And these turn out to be their inverses too. And recall the first thing was, of course, that x okay. So uh, let me just so all these come finally from some properties of uh, of delta, some transformation properties of the Sheridan curve. So let's look at uh, and all of these are independent of k. Uh, or meaning it, it holds for every k. Is that what you mean? Uh, uh, yes, 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 uh, yes, correct. Yeah, exactly. So I have silently suppressed the k there, but actually these things hold for all these. What we have is really a family of inner products in theory. It holds for all of them. Yes. Okay. Uh, so let, let's just quickly see why this would hold for the ti. So ti itself is, so if you recall, it's, it's formed from more elementary operations. So there was a t power half, and then there was something, you know, the c function, which came up many times. So it's this uh, times. So what does it do? Uh, this is, you know, the the operation si minus one. So this formula here is is something that you have seen before. So this, you know, this si minus one times this c alpha i and so on. It's it's something like this. Even ti acts on x to the mu. You get some multiple of x to the mu, and then there is this difference operator, right? So x to the mu minus x to the si mu uh, divided by something multiplied by something. So if you recall the formula that looked like that. So this this bit here is exactly the c. Okay. So when it's written this form. Okay, and c recall is so c alpha i of x is again t to the minus half. 1 minus t x to the alpha i. 1 minus x to the alpha. And alpha i is, of course, epsilon i minus epsilon j. OK, but uh, again, the key point is that, I mean, this this it's composed of these operators. So this operator, which has x's in it, okay, and we sort of know how to take stars of those, right? multiplication by x. I mean, it's, it's the star of this operator would just be replace x to the mu by x to the minus mu, whatever is key. And so you sort of need to understand how to compute the star of this operation, of this operator. And that's, the, well, you sort of need to understand how SI star is. That's more or less, right? So if you if you figured out what SI star is, then you know what PI star is. Okay? So that's that's really the computation. And again, uh, so let me, let me again quickly point this out. So how do you compute the adjoint of uh, a given SI, well, you try to do this. So constant term. So you apply SI to F1, uh, take F2 bar delta K. But again, the constant term map has the following nice property that, see, it's again the coefficient of X power zero. So if you just apply a given finite while group element to all the coefficients, the coefficient of x power zero, SI will map x power zero to x power zero, right? Zero goes to zero. All the other guys get mapped around, but we don't care. So for the constant term itself, it's, you know, if you apply a wild group element, you still get the same constant. Term. So that's more or less what, what you need to do here. So you just take uh, applying an SI to F1 is like, well, you, you apply SI to all of them. So this is just, I can apply SI to all three terms and the answer remains the same. So the SI on the first term will cancel the SI that's already there. The SI on the second term, so this is SI of, well, SI F2 whole bar, it's just the same as uh, 
SI at two bar, and then this is SI on the other. Okay, so again, uh, the point I just want to quickly make is that finally it comes down again like we saw before. Right? We need to understand what delta K bar is. Here you need to understand what the effect of a single SI on delta K is. Okay, now if you apply a simple reflection to delta K, it's actually uh, easy to see what happens if you think in terms of the affine roots. So what was delta really? It was all the affine positive roots. I mean, re rewritten in terms of Q and so on, but really it's this, it's one minus X to the alpha by one minus DX to the alpha. And these are, well, if you want to think in terms of the, the Katsumudi algebras and so on, these are the, the real roots of the corresponding, positive real roots of the corresponding affine Katsumudi algebra. So now, what you're trying to do is apply an SI, a simple reflection to the, all these terms. So uh, the, the general fact is that if you take the positive roots, so, uh, so this is the standard fact that if I take the positive roots of an affine guy and I apply a single uh, SI, a simple reflection, the only fellow it maps to the negative is alpha I itself. So this will just give you everything except alpha I will be mapped to itself and only one term will, will become negative, which is alpha I. Okay, so you get this minus alpha. So in a sense, when you apply this SI to this product, all the terms of the product sort of just map to themselves in some other order, but a single term alone changes sign. Okay, and what does that happen? Uh, what happens to that term? The alpha I term is really the one you care about. And there the alpha I gets mapped to minus alpha. Okay, so in other words, uh, what this does is well, it's the same same thing as before, except there is uh, uh, a term which is now minus alpha i. So re recall, I said this is what the C's look like. Uh, sorry, except they're the opposite. So this is really what's happening: a single C. So a single uh, term of the product was a C up to a power of t in front. So this is basically what's happening. When you apply SI, you get C alpha i by C minus alpha i. That's sort of the error. And the rest of the terms are all different. Okay, so that's that's the transformation property. So finally, again, if you notice, it boils down to this nice transformation property of the Sheridan curve. Okay. So we're using all the, the important things. It somehow comes from the affine positive roots and so on. Okay, so that sort of tells you that SI star. So let me just mention what this computation implies. It says that the adjoint of SI is nothing but that that coefficient that we saw in front. So it's this operator. So we call this known operator. Okay. C alpha i x by C alpha minus alpha i psi. And uh, this in turn, because of the formula which tells you how T is, is related to the SIs, you sort of compute, you will find this. Okay. So the point is uh, Ti stars are just Ti inverses. And then finally, uh, the y's. So to, to do the y's, I could, well, a simpler thing to do is to use the g. Okay, so recall that uh, the, I have the t's, I have the x's, and well, I have the y's, or in, in terms of the double affine algebra, I could use the, the element g instead. Okay, and if you recall what the element g does, uh, it had the following, you know, on, on the um, representation, polynomial representation, the operator g was the following. It would do this. It would do q to the minus mu n times x to the sort of the cyclic permutation of mu, right? S one, S two, S n minus one of mu. This was this was how uh, g acts on something. Now again, the question is, how does g act on the Sheridan kernel? So if you ask, what does it do to this this product? Well, uh, the answer is well, it just maps it to itself. Yeah, and uh, the simplest way to see that is we sort of look at the positive. Uh, Look at this epsilon n minus one minus epsilon n. So G sort of you know maps each one to the next. And see what it does to this guy. Uh, the formula says it maps it to G uh, Q to the minus mu n. So it's Q to the one and the cyclic permutation of this, which is X to the uh, minus epsilon one plus epsilon n. Okay. And if you see what this amounts to, this is, well, this is the root sorry, x to the, if you wish. Q was delta, the null root, and epsilon n, epsilon one minus epsilon n is exactly the highest root theta. And so this is what you would call the, the root alpha zero of the affine guy. 
So in terms of the affine roots, this is just the, the cyclic permutation of the, the affine root. So this is alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha n minus 1, this is alpha 0. Okay, And so G sort of just permutes, it's the diagram automorphism, it permutes the alphas amongst themselves. And in particular, it, it maps the positive roots of the affine to positive roots of the affine. So G just maps delta K to delta K. Okay, and and this, this property just tells you the following, that if you compute G star turns out to be just G plus. <coughs> okay, so finally, all these these adjoints are just various uh, nice ways of thinking about maybe various transformation properties of of the Sheridan kernel. And uh, so, so if I have G is G, oh, I forgot to say that. So if I know that G star is G inverse, then from this and the fact that T A stars are T A inverse, I can compute. Uh, the y's because recall the y's are just given in terms of this. So for example, y1, if you recall, was just, uh, I guess this element g, tn minus one, blah, blah, t1. Okay, so from this, I compute the star and you know, the order changes, I get t1 inverse. Uh, g inverse. Okay, and so that's y to the minus epsilon. I. So that's just the inverse of y. Okay, so all these, uh, uh, I mean, we've computed these adjoints and finally, the, the last adjoint we will need, so let me just state this, again, just follows from the definition itself, is the, the intertwiners. So if I compute the intertwiners coming from the double of finite algebra, those turn out to be self-adjoint. Okay, so you don't get uh, these inverses here, they are just self-adjoint. So again, just a question of just a simple computation. Okay, so uh, what uses all this? Uh, let's actually use this to prove uh, the orthogonality of the E's. Okay, so E orthogonality. So the claim is that this 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 Sheridnik inner product has the following property that the the E's themselves. implies E lambda E mu equals zero if lambda is not zero. Okay, so I should say let lambda mu belong to this, then statement one that the E's are orthogonal with respect to this inner product, lambda not equal to mu. And secondly, that the norm of a given E lambda can actually be explicitly computed. So, so I'm not going to write out the entire formula here, but this has an explicit product formula. Okay, so this um, will come out from the, the adjointness that we've talked about. So again, uh, so the first one is the standard argument that we usually give when we talk about self-adjoint operators, so eigenvalues. So recall that the E's are all eigenvalues for these operators Y's. So if Y gamma check acts on, <coughs> so the usual sort of computation, so let's do this. So on the one hand, you try acting it on the first component, uh, but because of the adjointness property, when it passes to the second, you get Y to the minus gamma check, E mu, and these will give you the, the two corresponding eigenvalues, so on the one side, so recall what the eigenvalue here was, it was that evaluation map as we called it. So it's e to the, uh, sorry, q to the minus lambda plus k v lambda inverse uh, rho. So this was this was what you needed to evaluate gamma check on. So this is the eigenvalue okay, uh, on, the, on the left side. The eigenvalue on the right hand side and also when I pull it out, I should also remember to take out, take it out as a bar. So that sort of takes care of this minus as well. So this uh, the right hand side by the same computation becomes minus mu plus k times v mu inverse rho comma gamma check. Okay, so now the point is if lambda and mu are different, then these two eigenvalues are going to be different. Okay, and that will that will force the e lambda e mu to be zero. So that's the that's the argument. So let's just see why the eigenvalues are different. So it, since this is 
true, uh, this implies that. Uh, so, so let's just compare the two eigenvalues. Uh, so consider the two guys. Uh, one of them is minus lambda. So forget the lambda check. So, the, so this is actually true for all gamma check. Right? So this should be true for all gamma check. That's the point. So I just compare the, the two linear functionals here, which is minus lambda plus k b lambda inverse rho versus minus mu plus k v mu inverse rho. So the claim is if lambda is not equal to mu, then these two guys can't be the same. Okay, so I claim they are different. Why is that? Well, uh, so if they are the same, suppose they are the same, then claim is lambda equals mu. Why do, uh, it, why do you want it for all uh, gamma check? Isn't it enough for one of them? No, for uh, what do you mean by is all what you All you want to know is that E lambda E mu is zero. Yes, you have to prove it is zero. So what I'm saying uh, is this so, equation here holds for all gamma check. And so he wants yeah. to find one for which it doesn't hold. But, but find one for which it is not equal. For which it is not equal. Ah, that's it. Okay, right. Yeah. Thanks. Exactly. So, so the claim is that, uh, I mean, if, if, if they are equal for all gamma check, it means they're identically equal as linear functionals, right? So these two, suppose they're identically equal, then I claim that force is lambda equals mu. Okay, so the claim is, this means that the two eigenvalues are the same, lambda equals mu. Okay, so proof, if you sort of look at the left-hand side, so you apply V lambda to the left-hand side. Well, what does it what does it give you? It gives you k rho minus v lambda of lambda. Okay. And v lambda of lambda, remember, is the element which is, I mean, this is just k rho minus lambda arranged in ascending order. Right? So this is a well, what is this? This is actually a regular dominant weight equation. So this is a regular dominant weight. Right, k rho is of course a regular dominant weight, and minus of lambda in ascending order is a, is a, is a dominant weight. So this is regular dominant. So same token on the right hand side, v mu on the right hand side is again going to give you something that's regular dominant. It's k rho minus mu arranged in ascending order. Okay, so if LHS equals RHS, then of course they're. I mean these are the dominant conjugates of the left hand side and right hand side, and they're both regular, right? So what this means is LHS equals RHS means their dominant conjugates are equal. So these implies these two are equal. And further, because they're regular, the, the wild group elements which map it to their dominant conjugates are also equal. So you make two conclusions. Number one, the dominant conjugates coincide. And secondly, the wild group elements which map them to their dominant conjugates coincide. So what this means is lambda in ascending order is the same as mu in ascending order. Further, V lambda is equal to mu. Okay, this means of course that lambda is equal. Because lambda is just V lambda inverse acting on lambda in ascending order. Okay, so uh, so this this establishes the first part of the proposition. So what we have proved here is if lambda is not equal to mu, then the two eigenvalues are not identically equal as linear functions. So there is at least one gamma check on which they differ, and that proves that E lambda E mu is. Equal. Okay, so uh, what about the 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 other uh, thing about the norm computation. Uh, so now for this, we'll just use the other, uh, the, the intertwiners. So, so recall E lambda, E lambda can be thought of as follows. There's a bunch of intertwiners. So I'm just going to suppress the check for the moment. Tau I1, tau I2, tau I k acting on one. Right. Um, So if you wish, this is really what E lambda, E lambda is. And now we'll use the fact that tau i1 star is actually tau i1. Okay, so I, I move the first tau i1 over. So it gives me tau i2, tau i k. Sorry, what are these tau i1? Tau, uh, tau is my check, the intertwines. What are i1, i2, i k? Uh, so that's the that's the reduced word that you get. So this is the definition of the E lambda, if you remember. So E lambda, you had to write this, uh, you know, U sub lambda that word as SI1, SI2, SIK. It was a reduced ah, word. The point is some of these could be pi's. So they're, they're either usual simple reflections or pi's. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sort of using this. So uh, it's these 
so uh, so again i should have mentioned that when i said this so when i said tau i star is tau i but uh, recall this is there's there's one exception here there's what we call tau pi check so this is only for the the usual i's from 1 to n minus 1 uh there we also need this tau pi check which comes up in the so recall tau pi check is just g check right that was our definition and g check star on the other hand that we have worked out earlier that's that's inverse so that alone differs that's actually the inverse okay so these are the 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 intertwiners which are going to appear when you try to construct e lambda right the definition of e lambda is just you apply this bunch of intertwiners to one now the point is i i move this tau i1 over to the other side as star but the star is just uh, you know itself so this is just going to give me tau i1 check squared of and the remaining guys okay but now we can start to see uh, how a formula will arise we we sort of know what the square of tau i1 is this is a product of those c functions so this is c alpha 1 of yt <coughs> c minus alpha 1 of C alpha i one. Sorry. Okay. If if i one is one of the guys from one to n minus one, so this square we we sort of know what it gives. So this this element now involves y's, and what's left here, remember, is also uh, you know it's it's just the it's the preceding uh, it's the preceding non-symmetric map on alpha one. So recall this this definition sort of recursive if you wish. and if you cut it off at any point what's left there is also a non symmetric the previous guy okay and and therefore the the thing in y is will act as the corresponding scalar on the e lambda graph okay so a certain scalar will come out and what's left is you know you're just doing this inductively you have the previous uh, so it's it's up to a scalar it's which you can compute it's equal to e lambda prime e lambda prime okay but on the other hand if this tau turned out to be pi check tau pi check then tau pi check uh, star is tau pi check inverse so the tau pi check star tau pi is just the identity so in some sense what this computation amounts to is you sort of keep pushing the the tau i is over the pi is will sort of just collapse and the other terms will you know the the square of those will give you a, a corresponding scalar outside okay so it gives you a product uh, at each term you know it, in some sense it's a product of all these different c c functions evaluated on the corresponding e's okay so there is a certain inductive nature to the whole thing and finally uh, however what you do need at the end is to know what 11k is okay so there is this pre factor which is a product times 11k and that so if you notice what is 11k that's the norm of the the non symmetric mcdonald polynomial e sub 0 right and this if you just look at the definition it's just a constant term of the sheridan kernel right there's no f there's no g they both one so this is the constant term okay and so uh, this is this is something which which is uh, sort of established separately in some sense so the formula for this constant term is established by by a different induction so this is so i'm not saying much here but this this induction sort of also requires an induction on k in some sense you sort of also have to change k so the, the point that raghavan made earlier there are there sort of a whole family of of inner products and you know you sort of also induct on k in some sense okay so i haven't quite managed to understand this proof too well but uh, so this at least the way i understand it is is sort of a separate argument you need to figure out the constant term of of the sheridan kernel via a separate induction but having done that it tells you what the the constant terms uh, sorry what the norms of all the other e lambda is via this inductive procedure okay so uh, that that tells you that the e's are orthogonal with respect to this inner product and uh, of is course is there a nice formula for the 11k ah uh, yes yes yeah yeah that's that's i mean it's equally nice it's it's a very similar uh, sort of formula with a similar product in some sense yeah it you know uh, i mean these these terms uh, i mean it has a very similar nature to to what you have until this point okay so uh, you know of course what we have been interested in 
is the P lambdas, the, I mean, the, the point of view that Arvind has talked about and so on, is the symmetric McDonald polynomials. And uh, the point again is that uh, it's just as easy to, to observe that from what we have said about the non-symmetric guys, that the symmetric McDonald polynomials are, also have this orthogonality. But now remember, I must choose dominant weights. I, I must choose lambda and mu to be dominant weights now. Okay, so why is, if lambda is not equal to mu? Okay, why is this true? Well, uh, you know, recall what, what was P lambda. It was actually an element in, in, so if you recall this thing we defined, it's a linear span. It belongs to the linear span of the E's. So in other words, P lambda is actually in the span of the E's W belonging to SM. And similarly, P mu will be in the span of the E W mu's, right, in the orbit of mu. And if lambda and mu are two different dominant weights you fixed in the beginning, then these two orbits don't have any, any elements in common. Okay, so these orbits themselves are disjoint. So of course, you to show that this is true, you just expand P in terms of E, right? So you, you sort of know how to, I mean, the proof itself just says, oh, well, expand P in terms of E, uh, expand the other guy in terms of E and just when you compute the inner product, every E here is orthogonal to every E which appears in the, the other side. Okay. So this is, this is straightforward. And these two guys are definitely orthogonal. Now, um, similarly, one can also compute the norm. Okay. So the norm computation is also a straightforward, uh, sort of by Similar means, so how does one compute the norm of P lambda? So recall the definition of P up to some power of T in front. This is just you apply the symmetrizer to E lambda. Right? So up to up to some powers of T and W lambda and so on. And uh, so again, what this means, so forgetting the scalars in front, it's E lambda. You just have to push the one not over. Okay, and it turns out that this symmetrizer is actually self dual. And it's, it's rather easy to show. So, the symmetrizer, even though each ti maps to ti inverse, this particular combination is, is actually self dual. Okay, so this is uh, therefore one not squared, but remember it was an idempotent. So it's actually the norm of P lambda, P lambda is actually just E lambda with one zero E lambda. So that's P lambda again. So up to a constant, therefore the norm of P lambda is just E lambda P lambda. Okay. But what's E lambda P lambda mean? This just means you write P lambda as a linear combination. So the thing that we just said, if you write uh, P lambda here, as a linear combination of the E's, then the coefficient of E lambda, so this, this leading coefficient that we'll get, plus you know other E's, but this coefficient is exactly the, the inner product, right? So if this coefficient is C maybe, then recall this C, well, how do you get it? You take inner product of P lambda with E lambda, that should give you C times E lambda E lambda. Right? because the E's are all orthogonal. So in other words, this norm, uh, you know, this, this coefficient of P lambda, sorry, coefficient of E lambda in P lambda. So this, this guy is, uh, is essentially nothing but the coefficient of E lambda in the expansion, in the E expansion of P lambda. Okay, up to, well, there's an E lambda, E lambda, right? So this coefficient into E lambda, E lambda. So there is also an E lambda, E lambda. Okay, so this is, this is the final formula in some sense because this coefficient is easy to compute. So this is known. So this, this we sort of talked about earlier that, you know, you can write, we had an actual expression and we just write this one knot, um, 
you can rewrite in terms of, in terms of the TIs, you can rewrite everything in terms of the tau ones. So this coefficient is, is easy to compute. This, this will involve the Cs. And therefore, the norm of P lambda, P lambda, up to all these known constants turns out to just be, you know, it's just a multiple of the norm of E lambda, E lambda. Okay, and that we sort of know from, from the previous uh, norm computation. Okay, so the point is we, we sort of also understand from all this, we understand not only the non-symmetric McDonald polynomials, but also the symmetric McDonald polynomials. Okay, so finally, so let me sort of finally touch base with the stuff that Arvind has talked about earlier. So the, the point is that this Sherednik kernel and this Sherednik inner product is slightly different from what uh, the inner product that Arvind talked about earlier, and uh, which actually involves the McDonald kernel or the McDonald inner product. Okay, so instead of uh, delta k, this actually involves what's called nabla sub k. And this nabla is just, well, it, it's slightly more symmetrized version if you wish. So alpha ranges over the positive roots and i goes from zero to k minus one. But if you recall the earlier, it was x to the alpha q to the i, x to the minus alpha, was q to the i plus one, but now you again put q to the i there. Okay, so it's just slightly off. You can sort of see the factor that's that's additional here. That is one minus x to the minus alphas, which are you know, additional in in uh, nabla as opposed to uh, delta. So there is this this obvious factor x to the minus alpha times delta. Okay, alpha ranges over the positive finite roots. But, and, and McDonald's definition is the following. So McDonald, the McDonald inner product between F and G. Uh, so recall now here F and G are symmetric functions. So this is the McDonald inner product. So this is actually equivalent to the inner product that uh, uh, Arvind talked about for finitely many variables as opposed to the, the infinitely many variables case that if you take F G, this is the McDonald in that product. So I'll put angular brackets for this. It's a constant term of F times not G bar, not, not the earlier bar. So let's call it star instead. And nabla. Okay, and star here just means uh, you only, you don't do anything to the Q's. You only map X mu to X minus mu. You don't touch the Q. Okay, so this is the, this is how McDonald defined it. So, so this is the McDonald in the product and it's uh, the main differences are it uses nabla in place of the delta. So, uh, and secondly, it's only applied to two symmetric functions f and g. And of course, what we have talked about until now is the Sherednik inner product, right? Which, which is seemingly different. So the point is that you have to, um, you know, relate the two if one wants to touch base with what Arvind's done before. And this is the, um, so let me just state the proposition. I'm not going to prove this. The proposition states that these two are essentially the same when restricted to the symmetric functions. So recall the Sherendic inner product is actually defined on all elements of CX. But if you took symmetric functions, then the Sherendic and the um, McDonald inner products turn out to be more or less the same. So the McDonald inner product FG sub K times a factor. So this is the Poincaré polynomial of SN, which also appeared earlier, the length generating function. This is equal to the Sherednik inner product. Okay. Not of F and G itself, but you sort of need to slightly twist G here. So this is the Sherednik inner product on the, the right, where this twisted, this G tilde is the following involution. Uh, you sort of take you know, this is the one where only Q goes to Q inverse, map Q to Q inverse. And we just keep X to mu as this. this is the other involution. Okay, so the G tilde is you take the, the symmetric function and you only map Q to Q inverse and don't do anything to the X mu's. Okay, so so this is the, this is the proposition which relates uh, these guys, number one, uh, also part two of this, which says that so this operation of sending Q to Q inverse actually doesn't do anything to the McDonald polynomial itself. Okay, so now uh, given this, 
the corollary is the following the the orthogonality that we talked about so if lambda is not equal to mu i mean they are both dominant then the p lambda p mu in the macdonald inner product so observe if i just uh, plug in p lambda p mu for f and g into that formula i will just get it to be some multiple of the the sheldonic inner product of p lambda and p mu okay but that we have already shown is zero okay so if the sheldonic inner product of the p is zero that implies that the the macdonald inner product of the p is zero. okay and and the uh, the last fact which is triangularity which again not going to prove but uh, let me just state it so the triangularity says that the macdonald polynomial p lambda has the following expression you can write it as m lambda plus a linear combination of the monomial symmetric functions m mu where mu is strictly less than lambda in the dominance order so this is uh, this is the symmetric macdonald polynomial as defined by us in terms of the uh, e's and so on and in fact there is sort of also a, a sheldonic version of it if you wish or a version for the non symmetric macdonald polynomials there's a triangularity here which says that uh, so now so, so recall this is only for the dominant guys so the triangularity as stated here is for the dominant lambdas whereas this is now for all lambdas which says if i take the non symmetric macdonald polynomial it it actually also has a this is for mu and put a little curly so that mu is less than lambda where this partial order here is the following it says mu less than lambda if and only if either of the two happens so you you look at uh, you arrange mu you look at its dominant conjugate of mu and the dominant conjugate of lambda either this is less than this if and only if either the dominant conjugate of mu is dominated by the dominant conjugate of lambda or they are equal and so if they are equal they are in the same while orbit and mu is smaller than lambda in the bruhr order on the orbit okay so what this translates i mean don't worry about what bruhr order is and so on Uh, what this says is the the anti dominant element in an orbit is sort of the largest so the anti dominant in other words the increasing anti dominant element of an orbit is the largest in the orbit and the dominant element is the smallest so if you actually wrote out if you took lambda to be dominant and computed e sub lambda uh, the only element of its the only monomial in you know x sub gamma where gamma comes from the orbit of lambda is x power lambda itself that's the only monomial which will feature from that orbit and all the other terms will come from the strictly smaller orbits in some sense okay so that's the that's again the triangularity again i'm not going to prove this but uh, the proof is more or less from the intertwiners uh, if you just take the definition of the e lambda as in terms of this box greedy word and so on uh, one can actually show that you know by induction that at each step the only monomial the largest monomial you are you are able to get is going to be this corresponding x of lambda x power lambda okay and the first fact follows from the second so where does this all lead us so i just wanted to touch base with uh, um, arvin's uh, characterization uh, eventually so the the two characterizing properties that the macdonald polynomial is supposed to have one is this triangularity so the macdonald polynomial as defined by us via intertwiners and the non symmetric macdonald polynomial and so on it indeed has the two defining properties so property 1 is triangularity and property 2 is the orthogonality with respect to the macdonald inner product right those are the two things which you need and what we managed to do is prove that both these properties hold and by the uniqueness that that holds for you know the fact that these two properties give rise to a unique family of polynomials uh, this shows that what i've been talked about and what we have constructed here are in fact the same okay good so I, i'm somewhat uh, over time but i will stop here
Any questions or comments? Are the lambdas also characterized by these two properties? Yes, 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 exactly. The e lambdas are also characterized by these two properties that uh, they are orthogonal with respect to the Sheridan Kinner product and this triangularity holds with respect to the spatial one. Uh, can you please go to the third slide? Uh, which one? Which third. slide? Third. Third. Yes. Uh, so, uh, why do we are defining this uh, involution map? You are sending Q to Q inverse, that's fine. But this X to the power mu also involves Q uh, inside, right? Because semi is alpha plus K delta. So no, 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 no. When, when I say this here, I mean this is only coming from, uh, so this mu is only in X. But I mean, what you're saying is sort of maybe the correct way to think about it. What we are saying is if, if I had an arbitrary element of the form mu plus P delta, that is being mapped to minus mu minus P delta. Yeah, so by this on uh, a fine positive roots, you mean that uh, X to the power alpha is being sent to X to the power minus alpha. Yes, absolutely, correct. Okay, and can you please go to the 19th page? Sorry, from three. Uh, yeah, uh, here you are defining the evolution T tilde. Again, if, uh, if you map to the Q inverse is fine, but if this mu is say uh, a positive affine root, then how can you fix it? Because already no, no, no. The, here, here mu is only in X. Yes. Yeah. Here I'm just talking about mu. It's not it's it's only a finite. Uh, it comes from the finite weight lattice. So this is, so if you recall, so this is sort of, uh, I guess Arvind didn't define it in these terms. He defined it on the, the power sum symmetric functions, I think. Um, but I mean, it turns out to be equivalent to this definition. Uh, so what McDonald does is, I mean, McDonald doesn't do this Q going to Q inverse business. So he just takes constant term of, you know, F and then G bar or, or what we are calling, I don't know what we called it, G star maybe. Uh, you just map, yeah, G star. You just map um, X mu's to X minus mu's, but don't do anything to the Q's. And then times this symmetric sort of McDonald term. Yeah. So can I ask you that uh, you had this P tilde equals P, P tilde yes. lambda. Yes, yes. What is, what, is the, what is the good way to see that? Uh, so I uh, so I spent a lot of time trying to see where you know how this would come about. So this was in McDonald's uh, this Burbaki uh, uh, Burbaki lectures is that the yeah. One? yeah yeah ah, he, yeah so he has this uh, the statement there there he just gets it by uh, well he gets it by showing P tildes have the same characterizing properties the same defining properties as the P's. Uh -huh. But many, I'm not so sure. I mean, in terms of what we are doing, I mean, I don't know if this is a correct way to arrange the proof in some sense, or whether it's it's. Uh, I mean, for us, the defining property sort of comes later, right? I mean, we show that it is the same. Yeah. But if you take the definition in terms of the symmetrizer applied to the e lambda, then how does one show this? I I have no idea actually. Mm. Do you do you know of any way of seeing this? No, I, I just came across this recently. And so, I, no, I don't know. But, but so one of the things that he makes is this normalized kernel. So uh, if you take uh, uh, sort of the, um, you know, the, the normalized inner product, I think. So the Sharonic inner product FG uh, K by the constant term. So by 1, 1 K. This normalized thing he says has the is invariant under this. So I, I hope I'm getting this right. So this uh, remains invariant under this transformation. Is that is that right? I mean, is stating that correctly. So McDonald makes a statement like this in his uh, this book, the affine Hecke algebras and uh, uh -huh. orthogonal polynomials. So I wonder if that yeah. will give a proof somehow. 
Yeah. But uh, if you if you didn't have this p tilde uh, equals p lambda, how does one? I mean, without it, can one still show this somehow that p lambda p mu zero in the McDonald? Because I mean, what we can we can show is p lambda p mu tilde is zero. Yeah. Because that's how these two are related. Okay, I will. I will look. I will think about it, but I don't know right away. Yeah, I'll okay. think about. It. Yeah. Any more questions or comments? Okay, if not, let's thank uh, Vishwanath. This is his last lecture. <laughs>